So welcome, so glad that you are connecting with us. Uh, maybe you stumbled along this, maybe one of your friends or family members shared this with you. I just wanna give you the heads up. This is the podcast, this is the message only version. If, if you want the full service with prayers and with announcements and welcome um, and music, there's another link. Go back to the YouTube page and you can check that entire service out. But we are so glad that you are connecting with us. One of the realities is that we wanna connect more with you. And so if you have questions or you want to know what, what are some other ways that, that you could get connected, then send Leah an email and we'll be able to touch base with you. Now on to the message. Well, as we are in this summer series called Barbecue or BBQ, which stands for Big Bold Questions, the question today that we want to explore as we look at life is how do I live with failures? I am sure that all of us ex have experienced failure in a myriad of ways. Sometimes we've had goals that we've set for ourselves and they've just never materialized or we really messed up and we had a failure. Uh, sometimes our failures have been in relationships. Sometimes it's with family or friends or it could be colleagues and these relationships have become fractured. And sometimes it happens in our relationship with God that we have failed him in different ways. And I know as I look at my own life, I could probably say yes to all three of those categories that I just mentioned briefly. Some time ago, uh, in one of the uh, study groups in the church, one of the small groups, it was called Beer, Books, and Banter, a group of men were meeting at a pub, and we were studying this book. And the book is called Love Does. It's written by an author whose name is Bob Goff. And Bob, this book became a number one bestseller in the New York Times. If you know anything about Bob Goff, well, perhaps some of you don't, so let me just tell you a little bit about him. He is the honorary counsel to the Republic of Uganda, representing the United States of America. And he has also been professor of law at Pepperdine University in the United States. But Bob writes this book with such candor and openness. I would encourage you to actually read it, and it will give you a lot of laughs. It will cause you at times to almost cry, but you'll begin to see in all the different ways how God's grace enters into his life and into our lives. And it was really a delightful study to think of some of the things that he has done and has experienced in life. But what I love most about him is that he is willing to be transparent about his life and kind of opens his heart to everybody around. And he talks about one of his great failures in life. And I want to share this story with you uh, because it is so powerful and it is so funny in retrospect. Well, his very first job was working at Lair's Greenhouse which is a very upscale restaurant. And he wanted to get a job as a waiter. But because he lacked the experience, they started him bussing tables. And he would set the tables up. He would clear up after the people had left. And he had to do that for an entire year. At the end of one year, the maitre d' said, you are ready to become a waiter. Now, a waiter in this establishment was very prestigious. And so Bob thought, I've got to do this right. He learned to memorize the menu. He learned how to properly uh, dress people when they sat down. He learned how to do proper protocol at every table. But one of the things he had to do was he had to wear a tuxedo. That's the kind of class that this restaurant had for their clientele. So Bob has learned his greetings, he has learned about the menu, and it's his first night to serve in this establishment. He is so excited. He gets his tuxedo on, he looks at himself in the mirror, and he realizes, I better get to work. But on his way to work, he knows that he's not going to be able to eat for a long time because the staff were not permitted to actually eat in that restaurant. And so on his way to work, he stops at a fast food outlet where they served Mexican food that he loved. 
and he ordered it hot and spicy. In his excitement, he just gobbles the food down and he gets to his establishment where he is going to be the waiter for the first night. As the people come in, the men are sort of starched and tidy, and the women look like they're off the front page of a Vogue magazine. The maitre d escorts the first group of people to the table that they have been assigned, and they're sitting in a gazebo, and it's a round table, and it's a fairly tight quarters. Bob comes to them, he greets them, he explains the menu, and he takes their order. In a few moments, he returns to this group of people with steaming plates of food. Now remember, this is a very tight environment, so try to picture this in your mind. He has to reach across the table in order to serve the food. And as he reaches across the table, he starts to feel a rumbling in the southern part of his body below his stomach. He has no time to react, and there he is stretched out across the table, and he has no time to regret having eaten that hot, spicy Mexican food. And suddenly, there is this most impressive, lengthy, noisy gassing that you could ever imagine happening. Bob is frozen in time. The guests at the table are in shock. The noise was so loud that it got the attention of the other patrons in the restaurant. And poor Bob, he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what to do. But one of the men at the table got up, and in disgust, he threw his napkin on the table. He walked up to the maitre d. They had a very animated conversation with a lot of descriptors about what had actually taken place. The maitre d came to the table, called Bob aside, and fired him on the spot. Poor Bob. He had been working at bussing tables for a whole year to get this job as a waiter. And here he was, fired on the very first night. His whole year of work had gone down the drain. He had messed up. He was a total failure. And it would take him six more months to be able to pay off the rest of the money owing on the tuxedo. But one thing he discovered is that even in the midst of our failures, it does not have to be the end of life. And Bob discovered that God does not want our failures to be such that they actually destroy us and own our life. You know, in our North American culture, we look at failure much like a baseball game. Three strikes and you are out. But that's not the way God works. God comes along and he is able to restore us. And as we look at scripture, we see over and over again many, many examples of God restoring people. And so, this morning, I would like to look at the failure of one person. His name is Peter, and how God actually restored him, and how his failure was a way that God used him to do amazing things in his future. And Peter's restoration can be our restoration as well. Before we get to the story, there is a backstory. And the backstory begins in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is beginning his ministry, and he comes and he sees Peter and his brother. And they're working in the family fishing industry. And Jesus says to them, come and follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And so we are told that immediately Peter left his occupation, and he began to follow Jesus. Over the next three years, he ministered with Jesus. He saw Jesus teaching people, healing people, restoring people, talking about the kingdom of God. 
and that became the focal point of Peter's life. And near the end of his three-year ministry on earth, Jesus gathered his disciples one night, and they were having a meal together. And as they are sharing in this meal together in this upper room, Jesus began to speak to his disciples, and he told them about his upcoming arrest and the fact that he would be betrayed by one in his midst. Now, Peter, he's rather confident in himself. He is rather rambunctious. He is certainly boastful. And as Mark records him, Peter made this claim, Jesus, even if all, including these disciples here, the other 11, fall away, I will not. In other words, Jesus, I'm your man. I will never desert you. I will never fail you. Well, John also recorded part of that conversation, and Peter even added these words, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. But Jesus said, Peter, that's not the way it's going to be. In fact, before the rooster crows twice, you will have denied me three times. And so we discover that when Jesus was arrested and taken into the great hall and accused, there were people who were gathered there, including Peter. And one young lady comes up to him and says, I kind of recognize you. Aren't you one of those people with Jesus? No, 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 I don't know Jesus. Later, someone else said, I think I saw you in that crowd. And Jesus, you were with Jesus. You're one of his. No, no. And he starts to become vehemently negative about Jesus. And then a third one, who was a relative of a man that Peter had hacked off his ear when they tried to arrest Jesus, said, I recognize you. You have that Galilean accent. And Peter starts to curse and to swear about even knowing Jesus. And Jesus is led away. And just as that happens, the rooster has crowed once. Remember what Jesus said before it crows twice? You will have denied me three times. And in the Gospel of Mark, we are told that Jesus turned and looked at Peter as he was led away. Peter runs out and dissolves in tears. He has been a total failure in his commitment to Jesus. So what is he going to do? The crucifixion of Jesus takes place. Three days later, the resurrection happens. And then we are told that Jesus remained on the earth for 40 days. And during that time, there were several encounters with Peter. But Peter had gone back to his old way of life, which was being a fisherman. And one morning, they are out fishing, and they see a figure on the shore, and it is Jesus, and he is cooking breakfast for them. In all of the previous encounters with Jesus, not a word has been said. Have you ever had that situation in life where there's something gone wrong between you and another and you have never dealt with it? And every time you see that person, what comes to mind? It's that unfinished business. And so here, Jesus and Peter had never had that conversation about the denial. But now it's going to happen. They're eating breakfast sitting by the seashore. And let me read to you from John 21. It starts at verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. And so they had this awkward time between them. The issue had never been addressed before, so Jesus breaks the silence. And he breaks the silence with three questions. The first question Jesus asked was this, Peter, do you love me more than these? And that seems to be a reference to his statement that he had made earlier, that if everyone abandons you, Jesus, I will still be there for you. In other words, if the other disciples abandon you, I won't. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, it's interesting, in English, we have this word love. And love kind of covers a multitude of things that we need to understand contextually. We can say, I love apple pie. Or we can say, I love opera. Or we can say, I love my children. Or I love my spouse. And the words have different connotations. In the original language, there were three words that were used for love. And in this story, there are two words that are used. And when we read it in English, we often don't get the full context of what was being said. So the three words are, there is eros, which can refer to erotic love or sexual love. There is phileo, which can refer to friendship. And then there was this interesting word that the Christians started to use called agape, which refers to unconditional love and acceptance. So here is what Jesus was asking Peter. Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And the first response of Peter is this, Lord, you know that I am your friend. He can't say, I love you unconditionally, because he knew that he had boasted about this in the past, and he had blown it. And he says, I can't boast anymore. I can't pretend to be saying and doing something and it's really something else. The best I can do, Jesus, at this point is, I can be your friend. So Jesus said, do you love me unconditionally more than all of these? Peter simply says, Lord, I want to be your friend. I'm your friend. Then Jesus asked him the second time, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Not in comparison to others. And Peter has the same reply. Lord, I'm your friend. That's where I'm at. And then the third time, Jesus changes and says, Peter, are you my friend? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You even know my heart. Lord, I am your friend. Now, some people wonder, why did Jesus ask him that three times? You know, sometimes when we've had things go wrong and we come to someone and say, I did something wrong and I need to deal with it with you. And they say, oh, forget it. Let's just move on. That becomes often the way in our culture. The reality is that doesn't really deal with the issue. God has created us psychologically to know that we need to deal with the issues one at a time. Three denials have to be dealt with. And though it is painful, it is the way to ultimate healing. Because Jesus knew that with the three denials, there would be the three affirmations of love. But more than that, Jesus would give three uh, reinstatements in terms of every time he said to him, care for my lambs, care for my sheep, care for the flock that is before you. 
Peter experienced amazing healing for his failure. Because Jesus not only forgave him, he restored him into a place of leadership. And Peter had assumed that because of his failure, he was done. And that's why he went back to fishing. Although the call of Jesus was to come and follow him and to lead men and women and children into a living relationship with the living God. In your failures and in my failures, as I read this story, I know that Peter's healing can be ours. That can be a reality for us because God's love does not fail regardless of our failures to actually love him. You see, God's acceptance is not conditioned on how well we perform. You see, Peter thought that's why he was accepted by God, because he was performing well, and he made all these blanket statements. And you see, when he failed, then his security fell apart, and he was done. And then the amazing thing was this, that in his failure, he discovered the grace and the mercy and the love of God. We need to be continually understanding that relationship with God. And that happens when we become transparent before God, even with our failures. See, Christianity is not about how well I perform, how well I keep all the rules and regulations. It's about a relationship. And when I mess up, when I have my failures, God wants to restore that so that we can be in a relationship with him. There is an ancient prayer of the church, which helps us to keep track of that relationship on a day-to-day basis. It is often referred to as the examination or the examination of conscience. And many people would pray this at the end of the day. It might take about five minutes. And they would think about three things in this prayer. The first thing is, what am I grateful to God for in this day? The second thing is, where have I noticed God's presence in this day? And the third thing is, is there anything I need to confess to God in terms of my failures? And this helps to keep the relationship alive and dynamic. It doesn't allow our days to go by unnoticed but we're keeping that relationship with God very open and transparent. And that's why in John, we read this promise. If we confess our sins, he, referring to God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So what do we do? We confess. To confess just means I admit to who I am and what I have done. And what is the promise? That God will forgive me if I ask him to do that. You know, in Psalm 103, there are many amazing promises that are given to us. And I would encourage you to read Psalm 103 over and over again until it becomes fixed in your mind. But listen to these words that the psalmist writes in verse 3. We give praise to the Lord. Why? Because he forgives all your sins. And then in verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. As high as the heavens are above the earth. So great is his love for those who fear him. And now listen to this. As far as the east is from the west, which is infinity, so far has he removed all of our sins. The writer to the Hebrews put it in these words. God remembers our sins no more. Have you ever heard the old adage, forgive and forget? Well, forget it, because it isn't realistic. We can't forget 
Only God has that capacity to remember our sins no more. We can forgive. And even if we recall what has been done against us, the pain is not there once we have forgiven. We've said, God, I've given that to you. But when we have sinned against God and we have failed against God, he says, I don't even remember it anymore. So what God is inviting you and me to do is to leave our failures of the past behind, to start to live every day to the full. Live in this present moment. As we accept God's forgiveness, our failures are set free from tying us down. We can be set free. See, if Peter didn't experience the forgiveness of God, he would have gone back to his old way of life. But he was transformed. And at the end of his life, here are some words from a forgiven person, a person who had messed up a failure in his life. He writes to his people that he has given leadership to in the early church these amazing words. You are a chosen people royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now notice this. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Your failures can become a redemptive moment. It can begin to transform your whole life because you are now a new people. You're the people of God. You have received the mercy of God. It changes how we live every day. This, this day, I invite you to embrace the mercy, the grace, and the forgiveness of God so that you and I can live life to the full. And that's the message of hope. As we live with our failures, they don't have to be that way anymore. They can become redemptive moments. Let's pray together. Lord God, we know that there are many times that we have messed up. We have failed in relationships. We have failed in our promises. We have failed in our commitment to you. And we know our hearts better than anyone else, but you know our hearts even better. So help us to be open and transparent with you so that we can embrace your forgiveness and we can be set on a new path that leads to life in all of its fullness. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so as you continue in the week that is before you, may you receive this blessing, that in the midst of all of failures, may you know the God of grace and mercy who gives you a new beginning every single day. And may the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit keep you and empower you for living life to the full. So go forth this day to love and serve God with all your heart. The Lord be with you. Amen.